And it's one of my favorite new initiatives that we've done here at the Carpenter's Boat Shop. Uh, and most importantly, it's because it allows us to connect with so many folks uh, in a way that we haven't typically connected with folks. I love being in people's kitchens and living rooms and uh, it just feels delightful. I'm gonna look ahead a little bit with you all and share with you our next speaker uh, is gonna be on January 27th. So it seems like ages from now, it's almost two months away, but January 27th, we'll be hosting Douglas Brooks. Douglas Brooks uh, is a longtime supporter and friend of the Carpenter's Boat Shop. And some of you all may know him because he was an apprentice in Japan. He will also be teaching a class here uh, come summer. He'll be teaching folks how to build Japanese river boats. So keep an eye out for that. I will keep you all informed as it gets a little bit closer. Um, just so you all know, uh, Annie's gonna put in the chat box an opportunity if you feel so inclined to give a donation to the Carpenter's Boat Shop. She'll share a link there with you all and feel free. Um, and just remember that there's no amount that is too small. And one of the other exciting pieces is that we're gonna be giving away a shaker box. So we're giving away shaker boxes to all new uh, inquiries. Um, and ironically enough, uh, a couple months ago, I picked a name and it was Heather's name. And um, anyway, it, and then for many other reasons, we were able to connect and I'm delighted to have her here this evening. So the shaker box thing is a real thing. Heather can attest to it. So. Um, so once we get started, you all, um, we're going to ask that if you have any questions that you put it into our chat box, uh, and then at the end of this session, um, we'll take questions and we'll be happy to um, answer as many of them as we possibly can at the end of this. Um, I'm super delighted to have Heather here this evening, um, and I guess with uh, nothing further to say, I'm going to just turn it over to Heather and uh, thank you so much in advance. It's going to be a great evening. So thank you all. Thank you, Alicia. And thank you all for being here. It's, it's a wonderful um, thing to be able to be part of this series. And I'm very grateful for the invitation. Um, as Alicia said, my name is Heather Leslie, and I'm director of the Darling Marine Center, which is the University of Maine's Marine Laboratory in Walpole. And uh, this evening, I want to share with you a little bit about the Darling Marine Center, if you haven't had a chance to visit us, uh, particularly recently. And then I'll talk a bit about the research that my students and I do uh, out of the Darling Marine Center and how it relates to uh, the challenges particularly facing Maine coastal communities in light of climate change impacts. And I'm looking forward to the discussion and the questions that will follow. Um, it's always a little bit hard to predict how long or short this will go, but I think we should have ample time for questions for sure. Um, so without further background, I will figure out how to share my screen here. Oop, that's not exactly what I was going to show you. How's that? Can you see just my slide now? Okay, great. Uh, so as I said, my name is Heather Leslie, and I'm um, in Walpole at the Darling Marine Center. I'm also one of 27 faculty in our School of Marine Sciences at the University of Maine. And befitting our, our coast, uh, we're spread all over the state. So we have faculty in Orono, we have nine faculty at the Darling Marine Center, and we have two faculty at the Gulf of Maine Research Institute in Portland. And we also have um, faculty working with us who are at the regional camp campus at the University of Maine in Machias. So the Darling Marine Center was gifted in 1965 by Ira C. Darling. He was a businessman from Chicago who came uh, every summer for a number of years, well more than 20 years, and uh, developed the property, particularly he was interested in forests. So if you, if you walk the property, you can see some older stands of trees and also trees that Mr. Darling and um, people from the area planted. We now have 182 acres on our campus. The original gift was about 125 acres. And that's right here, this peninsula. 
And then we were able to add an additional uh, 25 acres thanks to a gift from Mr. George Willette several years after Mr. Darling's gift. And this is a university campus where we're very lucky in Maine to have such an extensive uh, marine laboratory associated with our public university system. So you are welcome to walk there. We are open 365 days a year. And in the summertime, we have tours and we often have special events more recently virtually, but also in person that, that people are invited to attend. But really any time of year, you can walk the road or you can walk the trails. We just ask that you sign in on your phone when you arrive so that we have a sense of who's enjoying the campus. Um, we're about 40 people on campus year round and we're just about to get down to our real wintertime population. Right now we're closer to 70, 75 people every day uh, because we have 30 undergraduates who live with us throughout the fall as part of our semester by the sea program. So that program starts at the end of August and goes through mid-December. And so they're just finishing up their semester now. If you're familiar with, with this area of the Damariscotta River estuary, you probably know about uh, Clark's Cove, which is the uh, place where uh, mussels were first grown, shellfish was first farmed in Maine in recent history. This is um, the farm that Ed Myers set up, excuse me, in the early 1970s, thanks to a lease from the Department of Marine Resources. And to get to um, the Willette House on the Darling Center property, you pass past Clark's Cove. The mission of the Darling Marine Center is to connect people to the ocean by generating and sharing knowledge of coastal and marine ecosystems and the human communities that are part of them. And like many of our peer institutions around the country, we are focused on coastal marine environments, both muddy ones and rocky ones. Uh, we also do a lot of work in the nearshore ocean environment with fisheries and ecosystems, particularly uh, fisheries like the lobster fishery, the scallop fishery. Um, one thing that makes us a little bit different is that we do have this strong emphasis on uh, understanding the human dynamics and how they intersect with marine ecosystems. And that's a real strength at the University of Maine. And we've been able to integrate that into our programs at the Darling Marine Center as well, as I'll talk about in a little bit. We serve as a hub, not only for marine research and education, but also for community and industry engagement. And so um, while we have a lot of activities going on in the Damariscotta River estuary in, in Walpole, we're also working statewide with colleagues at Bigelow Labs, three miles down river, Gulf of Maine Research Institute, uh, Down East Institute, up toward Machias and uh, the whole network of marine laboratories that we have in the Gulf of Maine. We're actually very fortunate to have such a strong network of labs. And part of the reason why it's so important that we have this network is given the, the diversity and the extent of our coast. The main coast is more than 3,500 miles long and it is an economically and environmentally and socially diverse environment and, and um, set of geographies. And so there's really um, the need to have stations like ours sprinkled along the coast in order to understand how people are connected and benefiting and interacting with the environment at different places along our coast and also how to sustain those interactions. So while we do a lot of work in the Gulf of Maine, we also work globally. Uh, most of the nine faculty in residence like myself at the Darling Center have programs that extend from the Damariscotta River estuary out to all parts of the world's ocean. In my case, I've worked in um, Northwest Mexico and in Baja California Sur for more than 15 years now with collaborators from, from all over the world. Um, other scientists at the Darling Marine Center work in Antarctica, in the deep sea and hydrothermal vent communities and also in coral reef communities. And one of the important assets that enables us to do this work both globally and locally is our scientific diving program. We run the scientific diving program where there's instruction and also oversight of, of scuba diving and science diving uh, underneath the water. We run that for the entire University of Maine system. And so anyone who wants to dive um, while doing work at the University of Maine system campuses 
whether they're doing it in the Dam Rascado or in the Caribbean, need to go through our campus. I mentioned that we have undergraduates and residents right now. Um, this is a program that's been running for 28 years. And it's really grown along with the marine sciences major at the University of Maine, which now includes more than 400 students, 400 undergraduate students, as well as over 70 graduate students. And we've um, seen an increasing interest in this integrative approach that I mentioned before, where people are studying not only how coastal ecosystems work and the wide diversity of organisms and life forms in our coastal environments, but also students are really interested in how people fit into this puzzle. And so that's something that we integrate throughout the field and lab and intensive courses that they take during the fall semester. We also have opportunities for students and recent graduates to join us as research interns in the summer. So in the fall, we have students living and working at the Darling Marine Center, uh, all taking the same classes all fall. And then in the summertime, we have a much more diverse set of projects that students are engaged in, but it tends to be about the same number of people, 30 students. And many of them um, come from University of Maine or from um, local communities here in the mid coast. We also have a fair number of students who join us from other parts of the country. So if you know someone who's looking for a marine science position next summer, please encourage them to check out our website uh, in January. That's when announcements tend to get posted. One thing that makes us a little bit different than uh, our peer institutions is that we have a very strong connection uh, with business incubation and um, research entrepreneurship and startup companies right on our campus. Uh, and we have this business incubation that's focused on aquaculture in particular in collaboration with the Maine Aquaculture Innovation Center. This is an incubator program that's been in existence for more than 20 years and it's legislatively supported. And uh, we welcome uh, startup companies and, and um, entrepreneurs who are, who are learning or thinking about growing um, shellfish species or developing new value added marine products in new ways and might need help working out uh, a kink in their production system or aren't quite sure what to do next. We have flowing seawater facilities, facilities to raise algae like the picture on the right shows um, and also the ability to give uh, startup companies access to re research expertise, the researchers that we have um, working on campus year around and often students end up working with these companies. So it's, it's a really exciting and, and different um, element than I've seen at other marine labs that I've spent time at. The fact that we have these small companies that come and go quite dynamically. Uh, they might only be with us for a few months or they might be with us for a few years. And so they, they tend to be a much more fast paced element of um, the research process than, than some academic programs, which is really fun. Given our interest in um, understanding how our coastal environment works and also our longtime connections with um, the oyster industry, particularly in the, in the Dam Rascata River environment, we've been um, working closely with, with shellfish entrepreneurs in the Dam Rascata since the very beginnings of that industry in the 60s and 70s. Um, we also have a very strong focus on environmental monitoring and water quality in particular. And thanks to some recent investments from the National Science Foundation, we've been able to develop a series of coastal observing stations, those yellow buoy, that yellow buoy that's in the middle picture there, where um, we can deliver real time information on salinity and water temperature, air temperature, the uh, amount of phytoplankton in the water, the, the food resource that shellfish and, and other species need to survive. We have those stations that are out in different parts of the estuary, different parts of the, the year. And as I mentioned before, um, our research footprint really extends beyond this estuary. We actually move these buoys around to all different parts of the state in a very systematic fashion so that we can sample ocean conditions in the near shore environment in other parts of the state in collaboration with, with colleagues at other institutions. 
And this information ends up being really useful, um, not only for scientists, but also for fishermen and aquaculturalists who are looking for real-time data close to shore. Most of the observing network that we have in this country is much farther offshore. And while that gives you some indication of what condi conditions are, um, in coastal waters, it's not nearly as useful as, as having uh, tailored instruments and um, interpretation of the data that comes from them, which is what we're able to do thanks to these Lobo buoys. The final uh, bit I wanted to mention before giving a couple of examples of research projects uh, that we're working on is, is the trail system, which really is, is a gem. And if you haven't been to the Darling Center recently, or if your recollection is 20 or 25 years ago, um, you, you may not be aware what an extensive trail system we now have. It's over three miles of trails and it goes through um, not just the, the shoreline, the mile of shoreline that we have at the Darling Marine Center, but also um, some really nice um, secondary forest, pine um, oak forest and some old field environments as well as vernal pool and stream habitats. And so really any time of year, it, there's wonderful places to visit on the trail system. We just ask for you to sign in. Um, it definitely gets a little more difficult walking this time of year through April uh, when it's wetter and muddier and icier. But I have to say it's pretty much my favorite place to walk uh, in the area. So, as you've hopefully gotten a sense uh, from, from my opening remarks, there's a real strong emphasis in the work that we do at the Darling Marine Center and the University of Maine more generally on the connections between people and nature. And this is premised on um, the idea that resilient coastal human communities depend on resilient ecosystems. And by resilience, I'm talking about the ability of an individual person or organism or a system to maintain functioning in the face of substantial change. And we are particularly interested these days in understanding how people and the ecosystems that they are part of are responding to um, impacts of climate change and how uh, we might learn from those responses in order to uh, support adaptation and where necessary transformation of, of communities into the future. And this, this focus is, is very much consistent with a, a pretty big shift in, in how um, people have thought about stewardship and fisheries management uh, specifically over the last couple of decades. Um, the shift went from a real focus on managing individual stocks like, like this cod, this Atlantic cod here and paying attention only to the health of the cod population or other commercially important species to thinking about the ecosystem that the cod is embedded in, what the cod eats, where the cod spends the early part of its life, um, where fishermen catch the cod, how fishermen's behavior changes as cod populations change. All those connections are um, really important if we're to think about sustaining cod and the larger ecosystem in the face of climate impacts. And so ecosystem-based management recognizes these connections. It's also place-based. And so there's an acknowledgement that what works here in the Damariscotta River estuary or Pemaquid Peninsula area may not work quite as well if we're to go all the way down east or we're thinking about um, managing these types of interactions in Casco Bay or in a broader geographic sense. There's also a recognition with ecosystem-based approaches that not everybody has the same goals for ocean conservation and ocean management, that people have different competing goals. And uh, that's not a new idea. We've been aware of that on land and in the sea for a very, very long time. Uh, but the issue is, is when we don't make those goals explicit, it's a lot harder to be inclusive in terms of decision making and equitable in terms of outcomes. So ecosystem based approaches take us along the path of meeting um, our commitments to diversity and inclusion as well. And finally, uh, ecosystem-based approaches attend to changing conditions. 
what I mean by that is uh, there's uncertainty. There's uncertainty um, how quickly sea level will rise, how, in what way cod populations will respond to um, changing ocean conditions, changing temperatures, and also how people will respond. And so those different sources of uncertainty we, we can and need to manage them and ecosystem-based approaches enable us to manage them both um, to ensure that we have resilient human communities and also resilient ecosystems. So in the remaining time, um, I wanna talk a little bit, I wanna give a couple of examples of what those big ideas mean in practice and the work that we've done in collaboration with different community and government partners here in the mid coast to make these big ideas real and useful. And this work is done under the umbrella of what we call the Maine Coastal Community Resilience Project. It's a project that's been funded um, most recently by NOAA, by the Federal Ocean Agency, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. And uh, I'm talking about work that um, folks at the University of Maine at the Darling Center have done in collaboration with the Maine Department of Marine Resources, um, the Maine Sea Grant and the Maine Center for Coastal Fisheries. So it's really, it's been a coast-wide project. And our intention has been to do these three things listed on the, the slide, to identify what features contribute to resilience to change, particularly for human communities on the coast, and to synthesize and map that information in ways that community communities themselves can use in decision-making. And finally, to contribute to, to those plans and decision-making by helping to create what are called community bridge plans. You might think of them as another type of comprehensive plan, but the overall idea is to help communities plan for the future and adapt to change, particularly to climate change. So how we've made these three big ideas real um, has varied depending on geography. We've, we've worked in collaboration with um, community members in Stonington and Georgetown, um, here in, in Newcastle and Damascata in the upper part of the estuary. Um, and we're interested in, in seeking more partnerships into the future. And I just wanna give you a couple idea, uh, a couple examples of what types of analyses we've done uh, that may be, may be useful to folks at, at, at the municipal level in particular. Um, one early analysis was precipitated by work that uh, my student Marina Kakuza did as part of her graduate degree in marine biology and marine policy at UMaine. She was supporting the Georgetown comprehensive planning process that was running a couple of years ago, and particularly the Marine Resources Subcommittee. And Georgetown wanted to see data on trends in how fisheries landings and fisheries participation had changed through time. And these are data that individual fishermen uh, by statute have to deliver to the Department of Marine Resources on a regular basis. So essentially this was about bringing information that people in the community themselves had generated back to the community in a useful format. And since we initiated that that project, actually, the department has put together a fantastic dashboard. Uh, I'm not going to be able to find it on the fly here, but there's a, there's a great uh, website that, that the Department of Marine Resources has put together where you can actually look at the community scale at data like the type of data that, that Marina assembled for the community of Georgetown. So as she was involved in this particular process in Georgetown, it got us curious about how coastal communities throughout Maine were thinking about climate change. And so Marina led a statewide analysis of comprehensive plans, and she scored each of them based on different indicators of resilience to try to get a sense of how, um, how much emphasis different coastal communities are placing on preparing for climate change from a social and an eco ecological and an economic point of view. And what we found is that communities vary quite widely in how they're incorporating resilience principles into their comprehensive plans. And this map shows, shows our results in one, one slide. The size of these pies is indicative of how much of an emphasis there is on resilience principles. So you can see that some places have larger pies than others. And then if you look at the colors, the colors um, indicate what the emphasis 
of uh, the resilience planning is in different places. For example, uh, the blue refers to social resilience indicators. And you can see that in some places there's more emphasis on the social than in others. So this uh, is actually particularly timely because just yesterday, uh, Governor Mills announced a new program focused on community resilience, not just for coastal communities, but for communities statewide uh, to encourage 100 communities, up to 100 communities this next year to plan for the future through comprehensive plans and, and other community bridge plans. And so these data, which were, which were assembled in 2018 and 2019, provide a baseline for where coastal communities in particular are starting in this work and where they might go in terms of increasing the emphasis on resilience planning. So if you'd like to learn more about the statewide work on community resilience, I encourage you to check out Maine Won't Wait, which is the just released uh, website that the Maine Climate Council announced yesterday as part of the, our um, one year celebration of, of the Maine uh, Climate Action Plan. And in the chat here, I'll put a little video. Uh, there's a four minute video associated with this website that is a great introduction to how um, the Maine Climate Council process has worked so far and our hopes for engagement by um, community members all across the state in, in the coming years. I say are because I've had um, the great privilege of co leading one of the working groups that has supported the Maine Climate Council over the last couple of years. I've co-led um, the Coastal and Marine Working Group. So we spent over a year, mostly during the pandemic, assembling recommendations based on um, a lot of different people's expertise statewide. And that has that fed into the Climate Council process and, and the plan that is available through that website. So that's, that's sort of at the state level, uh, thinking about how resilience principles might support climate adaptation and, and resilience, uh, particularly on our coast. Dialing a little bit more close to home, uh, I wanna tell you briefly about work that we've been doing in the Damariscotta River estuary, particularly in the upper part of the estuary in the towns of Damariscotta and Newcastle. And um, this project was born out of my, um, my role as a, as a shellfish committee member. Uh, I'm a member of the, the Joint Shellfish Committee in Damariscotta and Newcastle. Um, and I've been on that board since I returned to Maine in, in 2015. Uh, and it, it struck me that, that there was a real untapped opportunity after a couple of years of, of sitting on that committee um, that there was a need for, for finer scale information on the health of shellfish resources um, so that this municipal body that, that manages shellfish um, on behalf of all of us in Damariscotta and Newcastle so that that body had adequate information to make decisions. And here um, we have multiple groups of marine scientists on this, this estuary alone between uh, the Darling Marine Center in, in Walpole and Bigelow Labs downriver on the other side, and then the Maine Department of Marine Resources Labs just around the corner in West Booth Bay. It seems like it, here, if not anywhere, we should be able to figure out how to um, support uh, municipal shellfish management, co-management, co uh, which is something that uh, can be done anywhere in the state, but does require um, a lot of community engagement. And so we're working together with the towns and with um, Lincoln Academy students and faculty and, and other uh, students and faculty at the Darling Marine Center in order to gather information. Um, and the, the question that has emerged from this work, really from the harvest of harvesters themselves primarily, is where have our soft shell clams gone and what else is changing and why in this busy estuary that is the Damariscotta River. We've also done some related work in the Madomic estuary, but uh, we, we began in the Damariscotta, so I'm gonna restrict my remarks to that, that place today. Uh, and so the basic idea here is to have um, the needs of local harvesters and other shellfish committee members 
guide the research agenda and to involve uh, students, high school students, undergraduate students, graduate students in the work as much as we possibly can, not only so that people are learning how to do science in a way that's applicable to local decision-making, but also so um, people are learning how um, democracy works, that, that these are decisions that citizens make uh, when they come together in the midst of winter, uh, and it really matters what type of information is available. So uh, we've been gathering information, gathering information on the soft shell clam populations and the other species that are harvested in the Damariscotta, which include uh, quahogs and oysters and razor clams and occasionally mussels. Um, so the two big ones are soft shell, soft shell clams and um, more recently oysters. And we gather field information a couple different ways this time of year. Um, actually, we, uh, we I think pulled the last boxes today. I hope I haven't gotten the final report. Um, this time of year, we pull these recruitment boxes that have been out on the mudflat since March or April. Uh, and the idea here is to get a sense of what the um, supply of young clams is in the environment. And so the little clams, when they're smaller than that mesh that's on top of the box, settle through the mesh when they're really quite microscopic and they grow inside the box, protected from predators. They're not uh, usually bothered by worms or crabs or other species that might eat them. And then they get up to small size and we count them all inside those boxes these next couple of weeks before the holidays. Um, so we deployed the first boxes in the upper part of the river in, um, in 2019, and we've had an expanded set of boxes out this year. Uh, in 2020, we weren't able to do this work, but we did some other cool things I'll tell you about in a moment. Um, and one of the neat things is that, is that while we're focused on this estuary in particular, the design of our study matches um, the design of studies that people are doing all along the main coast. And so we're part of a network of researchers, researchers that are studying shellfish recruitment along the main coast. And this is a, a bit of a canary in the coal, coal, coal mine. Um, we would expect to see changes in shellfish recruitment with, um, with climate change impacts for a variety of reasons. And so paying attention to how shell, sh shellfish recruitment shifts through time is an important bellwether of, of ecosystem health. We also monitor the health of adult populations. So that was for the baby um, shellfish, but then we also look at the adult animals, the ones that are harvestable. Um, and here in the summertime, we do surveys on areas that we have identified with the um, participation of harvesters and other local experts. And again, we're trying to figure out who's there and how many are there and, and how big they are, uh, and therefore how much they might be contributing to the next generation of clams and oysters and other harvestable shellfish. So thus far, this work has been confined to Damariscotta and Newcastle, but I'm optimistic that we might be able to expand this program um, to encompass the full, um, the full estuary. And the reason why um, I think that might be particularly interesting to do is that um, during the pandemic, we, we, we couldn't start field work in a timely fashion. It, it, it just, it wasn't possible in spring 2020. And so we, we ended up doing something very different um, during that year, we gathered local knowledge from harvesters and other local experts, perhaps some of you on the line right now. Um, and we did this in a systematic way so that this information could be part of this, the shellfish committee's um, knowledge base and, and it would be more explicit. And I'll tell you a little bit about how we did that. And then uh, I'm looking forward to your questions. So we essentially created these gazetteers, just like the main gazetteer um, that you should never leave home without. Um, and each page of the gazetteer was a part of the estuary, starting with uh, Salt Bay up here and then right around the bridge and, and down toward Dodge Point and the, the mouth of the estuary. And so then we, sent this gazetteer um, to more than 40 people um, and asked each individual to 
um, share the information that they had about shellfish and other um, species and human activities in the estuary, both in the Damariscotta as well as in the Madomic River estuary, using these stickers. Um, we're particularly interested in, in shellfish harvesting. We also had a bunch of stickers for sailing and other types of activities. But for, for enumerating shellfish abundance and activity in particular, um, we ask folks to use these different types of stickers to tell us where they were, where they found different species and how many of the different species they found and to put them in different quadrats of the map. So we gained really detailed information, fine scale information um, in an anonymous fashion from um, many harvesters. Let me be clear about that. So, so um, the, the students leading this work know who the information came from, but I'm sharing it with you now in a way that's anonymous to protect people's privacy. Um, and also if, if in some cases, if there was information only from one or two people, we don't show that information on the map. It's only if it's information from at least three people that we show it on the map. And so what we end with, end up with are um, maps like this, where again, here's Salt Bay up at the top and um, the, the bridge, the Twin Rivers Bridge, and, and then the upper estuary right, right below the town landing uh, and so forth. And you can see that this map, because it's showing the relative abundance of stickers, um, gives us an indication of where there are hot spots of river use activities overall. So this is not specific to shellfish, this, this graphic. This is all the activities, sailing, shellfishing, kayaking, um, sea farming, all the different things that go on in the Damariscotta. And you can see that there are some clear hot spots of activity in the upper estuary. Um, and you might say, well, I already knew that. I just needed to look out my window. But, but this is, is generating information in a systematic fashion at a scale that we can then use for, um, for censusing shellfish populations and also for thinking more systematically about the connections among different activities that are uh, happening in different parts of the river. And these maps have also revealed um, some, some important things that people haven't necessarily been talking about, at least not at the shellfish committee meetings recently. Um, for instance, uh, wild caught oysters are playing a pretty big role in the wild harvest um, by many, by, by a number of individuals right now. So, so some individuals are actually harvesting more oysters than soft shell clams at this point. And that's quite a shift from uh, the fishery 20 years ago, based on the local knowledge that we've assembled. Uh, we've also been able to document, as I said before, that the Upper Damariscotta is hosting a, a wide array of human activities, and those activities have shifted in emphasis through time. And then um, this approach, uh, which we paired with interviews, so each person after they did the Atlas work was then interviewed by Sarah Risley and Melissa Britch and the undergraduates who worked with them. And through the interviews, we were able to document um, additional activities and um, species phenomena that weren't necessarily being talked about as widely. For instance, the, men, the Menhaden harvest that happens in some parts of the river at some times of year. So in closing, um, I hope that I've, I've conveyed the point that um, by taking an interdisciplinary approach and, and learning about not only how the environment is doing and how it's changing, but also paying attention to how people are participating in these places, that this creates an information base that can be really quite helpful in terms of ecosystem-based stewardship. I'm telling you um, stories that are unfinished. And, and so um, by all means, stay, stay tuned. And if, you, if you'd like to learn more, um, please feel free to reach out to me uh, if, if I'm not able to answer all your questions this evening. Um, another important hallmark of the work that we're doing at the Darling Center is that it's in close partnership with uh, many people in the community, uh, business owners, fishermen, shellfish uh, farmers, and, and government scientists who are working with all of us to figure out how to sustain 
these dynamic environments in the face of climate change. And by doing research and education in this engaged, community engaged mode, we're able to ask questions that we, we wouldn't come up with by ourselves. Um, so I can't, I can't tell you how, um, yeah, how, how radically shifted my perspective is on this system and other ecosystems that I've worked in, thanks to the questions and the observations that, that fishermen in particular have shared with me, but also other people who know um, coastal environments really, really well and experience them really differently than I do. And we're fortunate because not only at the Darling Center, but at the University of Maine, um, this, is a, this is a real strength. And it's one that, that really uh, is, is a bit of a, a, a well-kept secret. Uh, often in university environments, you have people who are very focused on studying their little piece of the world in their particular way. And for whatever reason, I can't tell you what the secret sauce is, but the University of Maine um, has a faculty that really slips between different disciplines and different departments um, in, a, in a very um, effective fashion. I think part of it is because people are just really nice and there's, there's not a lot of big egos and that, that, that makes it a lot easier to get along and also to come up with interesting questions that you can answer together. Um, so if you're interested, uh, if you're a student or a, uh, a professional who's, who's interested in taking this type of interdisciplinary approach or applying it to your um, area of work, um, I would encourage you to reach out to colleagues at the University of Maine, even if it doesn't have anything to do with, with the marine environment. And with that, um, I will thank you for, for listening and invite your questions and comments. Thank you very much. Hi there, that was awesome. Thank you so, so much. Um, I do have a bunch of questions from our audience, so I'm gonna just start, I'm gonna dive right into it. Um, uh, my first question for you, Heather, um, is uh, I hear complaints from some of the lobster ind industry that the state provides substantial help to aquaculture, but not to the lobster industry. Is this true and why is aquaculture no longer a new, how about we just go, is this true and is this true and why? I, I think there is always truth to complaints, right? But it depends on your perspective. And so I, I certainly wouldn't um, um, guess what that person's experience has been who, who might have very good evidence for that, that point of view. My sense is that the, part, the Department of Marine Resources uh, is very deliberate and careful to support um, fishermen and aquaculturalists regardless of what species they harvest or farm or glean um, to do it in is even handed away as they possibly can. Um, that doesn't mean it makes everybody happy in every location, but I've been really struck by um, Commissioner Kelleher's even handed approach to, um, to, to, to marine resource management and also his, um, his careful attention to um, to addressing conflict and doing what he can to, to mitigate it. Um, the aquaculture division of the department has been um, a focus of increased investment recently. And that's in part because um, there's a sense among people in the aquaculture industry, um, particularly the main aquaculture association um, that there has not been uh, enough staff to process applications. And that has been uh, a challenge for not just people who want to, to put a farm in place, but all of us who um, have a stake in, in, in uh, the coastal and marine environment in our state. And so my understanding is that there's going to be investment in particular in the aquaculture division. Um, I've also heard very good news about increased investment in um, research related to fisheries across the department. And I think that'll be uh, rolling out over the next 12 months or so. Thank you. Um, will natural resource resilience planning be a required part of a comprehensive planning in coastal communities? 
So my sense, and, and so this is a great question for Kathleen Layden, my co-chair of the Coastal Marine Working Group. I don't think she's with us right now. Um, my sense is that comprehensive planning in the state of Maine currently is still a pretty voluntary endeavor. And so while there's guidance from the state on how to do it well, there aren't necessarily as many requirements as there have been in the past or as one might think. And so I think rather than having a stick approach, there's a carrot approach. And the governor's announcement yesterday is very much in line with that, that um, the state is working to provide guidance on how to develop plans that uh, are salient or thinking about climate resilience, but I haven't seen any indication that it's going to be required. I'm going to ask you a few more. Uh, is there any specific research being done on invasive exotic species that may be affecting the abundance and the recruitment of, for example, softshell clams? I don't know of any particular invasives that have been tied, well, other than the green crab. Um, but in, I'm, I'm, yeah, my mind goes in instantly to, um, to other species besides the crab. I don't know of any other species other than the crab that um, are considered a real problem for soft shells. I'm just trying to think about some of the sponges and, and other invertebrates. Um, the crabs for sure. So we know a lot about um, green crab abundance, we, uh, but not um, a lot about how to sufficiently manage or mitigate their impacts. They're voracious predators. And um, even that, that um, box that I showed you with the fine mesh, when the, when the crabs are very, very small, they can settle into the box with the clams. And if that happens, we open the box six months later and we have a little crab and no clams because they've all been uh, consumed. And so we have a pretty good sense of um, the impacts of crabs on that scale. That's the scale where, where people are able to do experiments and, and make careful observations. Um, what we don't have a really good handle on is um, the full extent of these populations in the subtitle and intertitle statewide, to my knowledge, um, or what we could do other than physically protect soft shell clams to mitigate this impact. And so that's why there's been um, some interesting experiments recently to, to do clam farming and actually complement wild harvest of clams and other shellfish with um, deliberate farming of soft shell clams and quahogs. Um, and the hope there is that if, if the shellfish can be protect, protected from predation, particularly when they're quite small, um, then the flats can be made more productive again. All right, one last question. Uh, do you mind sharing with us one challenge and one highlight of your work in the last year? One challenge and one highlight. Um, well, I think, I mean, in terms of the highlight, I would, I would say it's, it's the students. Um, I have a student who's defending her PhD tomorrow um, related to coastal community resilience. Um, and the work that, that Jess is doing here in Maine and has done in Mexico. And um, we have another PhD student defending tomorrow, Andrew Good, who's worked on lobsters and their response to climate impacts. Um, the work of these students is really inspiring and also the fact that um, all of us, all of us, but particularly students um, have been able to, to persevere in what's been a, a pretty challenging time to live and work, I'd say, as to be, to be human beings these, these last um, 20 something months. And so um, I get, the opportunity to talk with students daily and 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 um, mentor and teach them as a regular part of my job, um, and for that I feel really grateful. That that's been a real bright spot. Um, the challenge has has definitely been the the pandemic, and um, we have this amazing campus, almost two hundred acres in Walpole, um, where you know two or three summers ago we'd have tours of fifty people. 
um, every summer weekend for six or seven weekends in a row. Um, and we haven't been able to do that now for two summers running. We haven't had um, the opportunity to welcome folks to our campus in the same way that, that we did before. Um, and that makes me sad. I miss seeing uh, you all and um, having a chance to have big live science talks like we did two years ago in Brook Hall. We've done some virtual things, but um, there's something really special about being in the place and um, we're seeking ways to figure out how to do that type of in-place activity as we think about the design for next year. So yeah, I'd say I'd say the major challenge has been the pandemic, but through it all, the, the students have been a real bright spot. You mind if I sneak one more question in? Not at all. All right, excellent. Thank you. Uh, I'm gonna read it directly. Um, Heather, uh, can you share if studies and mapping indicate what variables have most impact on the resilience of species ecosystems? Is it increased human activity, population density and development along the coast or more the related to, to the variables related to the climate, water quality, temperature or biochemical toxic variables? And are there any patterns emerging from maps that point to bigger variables? Yeah, that's a really good and complicated question. And I'm afraid my answer is it depends and I don't know. <laughs> um, but it, whomever asked that question is thinking about all the right things. Um, and that's why I think it's so powerful to do this work deeply in places like the work I described in Damariscotta and Newcastle on the mudflats, and then to roll it up and think about our whole 3,500 mile coast. And of course you can't collect the same type of information for the whole coast that you have for one particular community. But I've found that um, by, by doing both of these things sort of simultaneously or alternating between them is it's a more rational or reasonable way to work um, that, that we do see patterns and, and we do um, identify solutions that we might not see if we're just working in one spot or looking at a much broader scale. Um, so as an ecologist, as someone who thinks about all those connections that were just mentioned, I would say that yes, they, they all matter and, and how much they matter <laughs> depends on what's going on in a particular setting. But when you look across enough places at once, which is what our coastwide studies have enabled us to do, we do start to, to glean patterns. And, and population density is a, is a really important factor. You know, you compare um, the main coast or even um, parts of our state with higher population density versus estuaries further south in, in New England or the mid-Atlantic, and you see some pretty striking patterns um, and impacts of popula human population density. So that's one driver, one driver for sure. Well, I can't thank you enough. Uh, a fantastic evening. And I also wanna just thank the Carpenters Boat Shop community out here for taking the time to be here and to support us and um, to have a fun, engaging evening together. So thank you all so very much. And I cannot wait to see you again in January. Thank you. <laughs> have a great evening. Thank you. <laughs> that was lovely. There you go. Very sweet. Who's that? That's the woman who was just talking. That's oh. Heather Leslie. Oh, boy. She's happy.